So I am going to switch the sequence uh, and we'll do sports because it complements uh, Dr. Vinokers. And there's some overlap, but some different information. I, I, I figured since we have the whole team here, it would be a good way to do it. Uh, So we're going to switch ahead. If you look at your agenda, we have sports in the afternoon here, but it's, these are short talks, and they're designed so that we can interact and ask questions along the way. And so one of the things that was brought up is in LQTS, the question always comes up regardless of age, right? More in teenagers because it's high school and there's competitive sports and teams and in college, uh, but throughout life. In LQTS, can sports, and then we have this pause, what are the negative? Can sports help? Can sports be detrimental? And that's a question that we always try to do risk, uh, risk benefit analysis. Like what, is, what's, what are the benefits and what could be the cons? So on the left side, we have here the negative components. Can sports increase risk of arrhythmias or having a life-threatening arrhythmia? Can it increase your adrenergic tone, your adrenaline levels? that may make an ICD, this was one of the concerns that they had decades ago, whether during the middle of sports and all that adrenaline pumping, whether an ICD would be less effective and require more shocks. Can participation in sports cause inappropriate shocks, where the device is trying its best to make a decision based on your rhythm, too fast rhythm, is it a, a life-threatening rhythm, is it not a life-threatening rhythm, and can you get a shock when you don't need one? And the, second, the last component that could be a negative with LQTS in sports is can it cause damage to the mechanical part of the system through trauma, football, rugby, those kind of things. Uh, the systems are tough and they usually handle it okay, but this is one of the potential negatives. But let's go on the right-hand side of the screen and we look at the positive components. When we look at our lives in general over a lifetime, we have to balance so many things in our environment. So will sports, especially teenagers, young adults, but also all adults uh, to at least 120, it, in, we know it improves quality of life. We know that activity, physical activity, is associated with how long you live. There's plenty of graphs and data coming out, especially with like, wearable monitors, Fitbit and all this, that every, people who walk more, who have, lead more active lives, live longer regardless of their underlying um, comorbidities or other diseases they might have. We know that activity will reduce the risk of getting other diseases that may be associated with increased weight, metabolic syndrome, adult onset diabetes, uh, sleep apnea. That is not just associated with, everybody always thinks sleep apnea is only weight. There's a lot of different reasons to have sleep apnea. But high blood pressure, stroke, all these diseases that we know are everywhere in our society globally are associated um, sports or activity, increased activity, we know reduces the risks associated with those diseases. And the other thing is when we're talking about all adults, but teenagers, young adults in particular, we know that sports or competitive, even more aggressive recreational sports as well, provides a social interaction which is part of our growing up. And it's not just young teens, it's us as adults. So we have to put this into perspective when we start looking at sports. And data has been collected over the last uh, couple of decades uh, through several groups looking at genotype positive sports participation. So these are patients who have a diagnosis but also have a gene associated with, uh, uh, with um, uh, ion channelopathy. And we look here, this is from the CHOP from Children's Hospital of Philadelphia. Most of these kids were diagnosed between the ages of seven to nine years. They had 212 uh, Children in this study who were genotype positive, so these aren't borderlines, these are actual, we know that they have a mutation. 103 of them participated in regular sports. And 26 were competitive, and 77 were recreational. And half were, about almost half were female and male. The average QTC was around 468, and if you were in a competitive group, there might be some bias here because this is a registry, but uh, 426 milliseconds. So not, nothing too dramatic in terms of very long QT. If you look at why they got diagnosed, uh, how do they end up getting or initially diagnosed? They had a family history as the majority, uh, and then uh, 
screening history, ECG for medication use, and here you have a breakup uh, in, this, in this pie chart. But if we look at the type of sports that they did, they had basketball, baseball, field hockey was a big one that showed up soccer, track, softball, uh, football, cheerleading, and others. So the sport type that these the kids participated over a follow-up of several years was pretty well diversified. And during this period, they found that there were no LQTS symptoms during sports in treatment compliant patients. And this is the question that was brought up about compliance, taking beta blocker. When the plan was personalized to the individual and they were compliant with treatment plan, in this case beta blockers uh, and other things, there were no LQTS symptoms during or right after sport events. So this is kind of reassuring in many ways that we've learned over the years that you can still allow uh, for a, a, a large number of patients, you can still allow uh, sports with the caveat that it has to be compliance with the treatment plan. And we look at, well, it's only 200 patients or 100, a little over 100 patients that participated in sports. When you actually add up what we call this magic number of patient years of follow-up, if you add up how many years total of humans did we follow uh, over this study, it was 755 years, patient years of follow-up. And the average length of follow-up was seven years. And most of these kids were diagnosed, uh, entered into, uh, were diagnosed in age seven. So you have through the mid-teenage years in this group. So a little reassuring there. Now in a multinational ICD sports registry, which includes uh, in patients who have an ICD, and they can have different kinds, not just long QT, they can have other uh, congenital uh, high-risk diseases. The registry had 441 patients between 2006 and 2014. So they took a subgroup of these. They took 129 athletes, and of course, again, now I'm saying the 396 person years. So we have almost 400 years of experience in this 129 athletes because they were followed for a long period of time. And out of this 129 athletes, they had to be uh, participating in organized sports and regular competition. So it's not just they wanted to get the group that actually has to go to practice, has somebody yelling at them at the coach at the sideline, has to be performing, and they took this group and, and followed them. And the, uh, in the middle of the group was about 17 years of age. So these were uh, young adults and children between the ages of 10 and 21, organized sports in competition. Greater than class 1A, and many may have seen these classifications, uh, 1A is uh, what they call how much muscle you have to use and how dynamic is the activity. So 1A or less is, could be something like uh, golfing, uh, billiards, and some other activities like that versus uh, skydiving, uh, surfing, uh, water sports, boxing. So those fall into a different category in terms of adrenaline state, and most of us can kind of picture why. Uh, if you look at who made up this registry here on the right-hand side of the screen, long QT was the most common. So it gives us kind of, for, this, for today, this gives us a lot of information on this subgroup. But we start having hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, which is a very different disease, and then it goes down to the less, more rare diseases. So it was, it was represented in there compared to others, and these are patients who have an ICD and who have, at one point, you know, a sports was completely banned for anybody uh, years ago, over a decade ago, uh, the restrictions. But over time, some people said, like, you know, I'm going to compete anyway. So that's how these registries were able to collect information. So out of 129 uh, athletes, there were no deaths associated with sudden death due to ventricular fibrillation or the fast tachyarrhythmics that we see. There were no external resuscitations during or after sports needed in this group of patients who were competing. There were no severe injuries resulting from arrhythmia-induced syncope shock. Now we talked about syncope, it's fainting, right? Or getting shocked when you're not supposed to. So one of the concerns has always been, okay, football, you're gonna grab that football, and the, everything goes off, and you're standing there, and you get shocked when you're not supposed to, and you let your guard down, you can get run over, right? So can you get injuries in the middle of the game or in, uh, where you can get hurt? For example, rock climbing or something like that, right? So where you have to have 100% attention. So there were no severe injuries resulting from arrhythmia-induced shocks or an inappropriate shock, a shock for the wrong reason where the device is trying to make a decision. However, when you looked at 129 athletes, uh, 18 of them did have proper therapy for ventricular life, potentially life-threatening arrhythmias at some point during that follow-up year. It just wasn't, it just wasn't during or after sports. 
could have been a night. It could have been the one day not taking beta blockers. It could have been these other things. And, but if you look at um, during competition, who got a shock uh, during some kind of formal competition? There were four individuals that got an appropriate shock uh, during therapy with no uh, resuscitation required, no injury uh, resulting from that. So here we just have, what, what were the four patients out of 129 that received an appropriate shock for the right rhythm during or right after competition? If you look here on the right-hand side, they were all high school except one, the Division Three baseball game. Uh, only one of them was LQTS. So when you start looking at it, only one was LQTS during a soccer practice uh, high school varsity game. Interesting here, and this is not a surprise, 35% of one-third of the athletes did receive at some point an inappropriate shock. And when we say inappropriate shock, we're saying the device is, wow, your heart rate's going super fast. Is it life-threatening? I will shock. If it's not life-threatening, I will not shock. But it has to make a decision. And if it's going fast and it can't decide, it always favors giving a shock if you're over 200 beats a minute because it doesn't want to miss the real thing. So that was an, but a third of the patients at some point received an inappropriate shock. It could be a lead problem, a system mechanical where the leads after many years, you know, they get, start getting artifact or static noise in the lead and the device sees all this noise and makes a decision. Or it could be that the heart rate, in some young patients, the heart rate could hit 240 beats a minute, which is above the program uh, rate of the device. We know that uh, when they actually looked in these registries at uh, uh, people participating in sports, and this is survival probability in terms of the integrity of the lead. So if we take, actually all of us have, you know, a phone of one form or another, a computer, you know that cable after a while just doesn't work, right? Because you keep bending it and, and then you, it doesn't charge right, your phone. So the cables in here are a lot more sophisticated, they're a lot more expensive, but over time they can also wear down and you start getting that electrical noise. So, but these, uh, these leads can last, if you look here, they can last a good, um, at least seven, seven and a half years with some decay, and then it kind of flattens out up to 15 years. And these are we're talking about in athletes, right? So a lot of motion up here in the collarbone, a lot of rubbing of the leads. So, but the leads are getting better over time. And, but that was one of the risks that we initially talked about in the beginning of this talk. So what does it come down to? A lot of Dr. Van Oker's discussion focused on this personalizing. So when you get numbers from all of today's talks, and when you read things on Google, and you're looking at population sample, those statistics apply to the whole population, 1,000 people, 500 people, and you're trying to figure out where you fit in. We're trying to personalize it more with the risk score that we're calculating. But ultimately, we take a lot of information and we try to make it apply to the one person, and that's where shared decision making. And that's this concept that makes sense, but we've had a, this formal terminology for it now, that says that the patient the provider, the family, everybody kind of puts together a plan and tries to figure out what is the best benefit and risk, not just for QT issue, but just for life in general in terms of quality of life. So right now the current, uh, the latest uh, recommendations from the AHA and American College of Cardiology uh, is that it is reasonable for an asymptomatic uh, patient, an athlete, so an athlete who's not had any symptoms before with a gene positive phenotype negative, which means they have the gene, but they got nothing else. The ECG, they haven't passed out, the ECG is normal. To, they're, they're able to uh, participate in competitive sports with appropriate precautionary measures, and I'll show that in the next slide. And in some patients who have obvious long QT on an ECG, may be considered to participate in competitive sports as long as appropriate, uh, appropriate precautionary measures are in place, and that there has been no symptoms in the last three months, right? If you're having passing out every week, then a competitive sports is not recommended. And except competitive swimming in patients who've had previous syncope, LQT1, because it is associated with swimming and it's this complicated reflex in the body, the nervous system, and it's not well understood, but we know that swimming causes some reflexes for us. Uh, they include, may include the diver's reflex. That's been studied for over 100, you know, for 80 years probably. But uh, so sports is now, possible in a lot of, but it has to be taken in the context of the family situation, the comfort level of the patient, and, and uh, appropriate precautions, very similar, uh, this is Dr. Vinokers uh, here, where credible meds, the app is really w well received, 
fevers treat, as he said, so fevers are treated to, we all want to treat a fever, right, because we don't feel well, but in, in, in patients, uh, you want to make sure that they're getting the right amount of Tylenol and everything so that uh, the fever isn't excessive, or overheating during a sports competitive event. So it's not just fevers, but it's overheating, 90 days, worse humidity, and you got to track me. Oh, and they forgot to bring the Gatorade. So all these things are setups for potential problems. So hydration plays a role here in the bottom left of the screen. The emergency plan, and I agree 100% that it's better, especially if you have teenagers, young kids, college students, or even adults, it's better to have an emergency plan in place so everybody is aware of it than people kind of denying it and then doing their own activities and then there is no plan in place. And the last slide I have here, well, the last, uh, uh, second to last uh, logo I have here is situational awareness. If you know it's a hot day and you know it's humid and or you're going to be traveling, take, the extra ba take extra medication with you, make sure you hydrate even more aggressively depending on the situation. So you have to kind of be aware of your day-to-day -day activity. And an AED is part of any plan, whether it's in an organized setting like a school event or in a home setting or an outing or a vacation. And I wanted to tie this in because Dr. Binoker's talk included a lot of the sports um, components. And since I think he's still here somewhere, it'd be nice to grab uh, any questions and then we can address it. Any questions? Looks like everybody's hungry. Yes, please. When you said that uh, uh, the, when you said that the, uh, actual level was uh, like 460 to 470 when they uh, were symptomatic and they were allowed under cautionary measures. Was that the base or was oh. that while they were exercising in that so, uh, competitive sport? So this was at, uh, those QTCs when is they, they took all the athletes and they just took their average of what they're presenting when they initially got diagnosed into the registry. Okay. Because at that point, when the registry was started, sports was not recommended. So back, if you go back to 2005, sports was banned, especially competitive sports yes. was banned across the board. So this just took people that still did competitive sports, and then we were able to follow them along the way. So it says that in that group, that, that, that was their average. So these weren't the highest risk, risk patients, like if their QTC was over 500, um, the average wasn't that high. And it's probably because the ones that are that high didn't do competition. Right. So that means that when the, the sports event was taking place, their QT was getting lengthier. Uh, we don't know because they, none of them got measured during sports. These were just one, you know, their ECG where they got right. the diagnosis right. of long QT. Right. Some people will shorten, but remember some people can, you can still have an event and have a relatively low QT interval because it's, the QT is just one component of the whole complex physiology of adrenaline and risk. I used to be in a more athletic mode running and high impact aerobics mm -hmm. and uh, a lot of uh, exercise. Mm -hmm. And that's when I had more syncoscope events. Right. And uh, then when I stopped exercising and got fat, I felt better. So that goes along with personalizing therapy. So uh, everybody's very different. So for some people who have a very sensitive to adrenergic trigger or adrenaline, like exercise, then exercise is not part of that. On the other hand, modifications for um, like walking, more frequent, less aerobic, but maybe maintaining a certain number of steps at your own leisure plays a role too. Okay, that's what I was wondering if I could, <laughs> Just how much I could do without actually, getting sick. Right, so, as long, so, so it all depends on the approach, the mindset approach. We know that mild activity, which is uh, at the UK, in the biobank study out of Europe, they had over 100,000 patients with fit, not Fitbits, but it wore accelerometers. If they did, 10 minutes, 20 minutes a day of some walking, brisk walking, increase how long they live by several years. So brisk walking is 
exercise. If you do it every day, it's better than just going to the gym and, you know, and like passing out on a treadmill once a week. So if you walk 20 minutes a day, 15 minutes a day, that's better than just going once or twice to the gym and then you're like wiped out. More okay, questions. thank you. Oh. Um, I wanted to follow up on that question that you were starting to get to about the QTC. Is there some recommendation you have for folks generally if they are on appropriate therapy and they still maintain like a QTC of 530, 540? Are, is that a population that's typically not recommended to do intensive exercise? Uh, competitive, I don't know, Jeff would probably, and Elon and a few of my colleagues can weigh in on this, but if you have a QTC of 530 competitive sports on medication, it's a less studied group and probably a higher risk profile. I don't know, Jeff, mm -hmm. Elon? I'm going to share this answer with my f colleagues. I mean, I'm not sure that anybody truly knows. Um, if you're, you know, if you're long QT3 that very reliably shortens and you're 530, mm -hmm. I don't care about sports. I care what's going to happen in your bed. Right. If you're even a 2 that tends to shorten, I mean, if you're, if you're long QT2 and you're 530, you're going to have a very intensive treatment plan anyway. If you were long QT1 and you were on really good beta blocker. Uh, so I, I don't think I would forbid it, right? I would sit right. with the family, explain the pros and cons. We would decide together what sports we might or might not be willing to do. Right. They'd be and, the sports may be limited. So we wouldn't go with the rock climbing, surfing, and then wind sailing and dropping into a, you know. So that may not be the one for Agreed. type one. But Downhill skiing, by the way, Nobody ever brings it up because it doesn't seem like all that athletic, but talk about places you don't want to pass out. Yep. So. Thanks. Yes, and uh, as you heard, the type of sport is always uh, should be considered, and we covered this in number of years that you need to think about type of sport your kids are you want to exercise to be to avoid like LQT1 you mentioned the sports should not be sports which will be all of the sudden changing the pace all the time if you have this sudden rush of adrenaline sudden changes in your uh, sport it's different than you steadily run for three miles uh, with uh, or fast walk it's it's much better if this adaptation to sport is gradual I think we have a lunch downstairs. I wanted to check whether it's too cold for you. Maybe we'll ask organizers to, I mean, the hotel to decrease it or improve, in, increase temperature, yes? yes. Good, yes. I will do it. So uh, right now the plan is as follows, that we have a lunch. Ah, there's one more question. I will come to you. Um, uh, the plan is that we have a lunch just below us, a similar room but one floor below us. And what we are planning to have is that all of us will send, uh, sit at different tables. We will be happy to entertain any questions during lunch. So uh, each of us, we are not going to sit together. I eat from time to time with them uh, apart today. <laughs> so we will sit separately with you and we'll be happy to address questions. But I forgot about one more question which was raised. But uh, it, the question is, is it, with sports, my, when my son, it was now 35 in high school, um, he had a plan. But um, we, we went to the school board and talked to them about requiring an EKG for all athletes. And they rejected it. Is there anything in place right now, because it's, it's been 20 years that you guys or you know of where they're kind of requiring that kind of thing? So, now Jeff, it varies from school to school, but I think most schools are receptive now to plans, but they may not, it, it, it may not be as dramatic unless the school has had some experience. So, I, so think one I, of the things I can add, Spencer, the following, that mm, there was a statement of American Heart Association, which was published about two, three years ago, which was based on very large data, 
Uh, some data, in fact, obtained in Texas, some obtained, I think, in Minnesota, and they survey and they analyze uh, whether screening high schoolers for uh, risk of arrhythmic events uh, is worth doing and cause effective and so on. And altogether, the conclusions were that based on few studies here and even a couple of from abroad, there is no requirement these days by American Heart Association that every participant in school should be uh, having ECG checked. I'm not speaking about long QT patients, I'm speaking about general school children. This is what, what this document concluded. However, I know at the same time that there are some schools in some states which have different point of view and they continue this kind of precaution and whoever goes to varsity or other type of activities, they have the ECGs done. So mm, we are not following at this moment in United States what France, Italy and Spain are doing that every possible sport mm, uh, activity requires ECG. Over there, there is no way to get to any sport without ECG. Over here in the United States, we don't have this rule. And uh, uh, right now, this was a lot of debate about, uh, uh, about uh, whether implemented, but at this stage, it's not done systematically. Okay. Any comments, Jeff? Or? Yes. I mean, I, I would say, I think, m much the same. There are several countries where this has been widespread um, standard practice for many years. Italy, Israel, Japan screen either all children or all athletes. And of course, they find things, and then they pull them out of sports. Um, but the current recommendations in the United States are, are to screen with a, a careful questioning for symptoms and family history of symptoms and examination with stethoscope and not to do ECG. We know full well that that kind of evaluation does not find all of the problems that we care about. I think some people feel that when we have AEDs in school and CPR training in school, it doesn't matter as much that we have found the particular people as long as we have a way to rescue the ones that, that will have an event. And from a cost-effectiveness point of view, I mean, unfortunately, far, far more children die from not wearing seat belts, shootings, mental health issues than, than we ever touch with arrhythmic sudden death. And so I think in, in, the, in the world as it is, people have put priorities other places. I think thank you very much. Let's go down to lunch and we'll resume after lunch enjoying the session. Thank you.